What are we doing? Physics. Okay, in this problem, we're gonna take this race car, which we've seen before, and we're gonna have this race car traveling along at an initial velocity of 50 meters per second. Now this race car is gonna hit the brakes and it's gonna stop. Uh, so when the, it hits the brakes or applies the brakes, uh, ultimately what there's gonna be is a force backwards by the brakes on the car. And that force by the brakes is going to be 15 thousand newtons. Now realize those brakes are acting on this car which has a mass of 1,000 kilograms. So the car is going to slow down. Uh, what we're going to go through and do is we're actually going to solve for the stopping distance of the car in this problem. So the fact of the matter is this is already a problem we can solve. Uh, we can go through and we could use Newton's second law as well as the kinematic equations to solve for the stopping distance. But I want to do this in a different way. I want to go through and use the work energy theorem in order to solve this problem. So this is the work energy theorem. If you haven't seen this before, take a look at this video on the work energy theorem and how it's derived and what the different variables within it mean. So we're going to apply the work energy theorem to this car in order to figure out exactly how far forward the car is going to travel before it comes to a stop. And in order to do this, I want to use the work energy theorem, but I want to look at it graphically. So down here, what we're going to draw is a box. And this box is going to represent the mechanical energy of this race car. Now remember, mechanical energy is made up of two things. It's made up of kinetic energy as well as potential energy. Now this could be gravitational potential or elastic potential. In this case, it, it doesn't matter. It's not gonna come into play at all, but we'll get to that. Realize this box is really just a graphical representation of this equation. And in order to understand what's going on in this problem, whether we look at it here or with this formula, we need to understand exactly the forces which are doing work on the car. So what we need to do as always is draw a free body diagram of this car. For this car moving forward, it's moving forward, but it's slowing down. So there is no force forward on the car. There's only gravity, the normal force, and the force backwards by the brakes. Now, if this car moves horizontally, the normal force is not gonna do any work on the car because the normal force is at a right angle to the displacement. So it does no work. The same applies for gravity. Gravity's pulling down, but the car's never going to move vertically. So gravity will do no work. That is to say, the potential energy of the car is never going to change. So the only force that we have doing work in this problem is in fact the brakes. The brakes are doing work on the car to take energy away. So what we're gonna do here is show all of the forces which are doing work on the car, which in this case is just the work by the brakes. So the brakes are doing work on the car and this is work that we would say is non-conservative. What's that mean? Well, non-conservative work changes the total mechanical energy of an object. So in this case, we're talking about the car. The brakes are going to take energy away from the car, so they are doing non-conservative work. Now that's gonna become important when we start looking up here. So now that we've actually shown everything we possibly can with this, let's actually start filling out the work energy theorem, just like it's a form. So I'm gonna go through each of these five different variables one at a time and determine the value for each of these. Let's start with the initial kinetic energy. We know the initial kinetic energy is one half times mass, that's 1,000, times the initial velocity squared. Now, if you're not familiar with kinetic energy, just click up here, you can see the video on kinetic energy and how it is derived. Now, this initial kinetic energy is going to work out to be 1.25 times 10 to the sixth joules. Moving on to the initial potential. We have a 1,000 kilogram car. Acceleration due to gravity is 9.8, assuming this is happening on Earth. And there's a height of zero. So this rather conveniently works out to be zero. Now our non-conservative work 
Going back over here, the only thing doing non-conservative work on the car is the work by the brakes. And the work by the brakes, going back to our formula for work, is going to be the force by the brakes, that's 15,000, multiplied by our displacement. Now we don't know the displacement, so we're just going to leave that as D. And then the last term here, of course, is the cosine of the angle between the force backwards and the displacement forward. So that's going to be 180. Realize the cosine of 180 is negative 1. And so this leaves us with negative 15,000 D. So the work by the brakes is some negative value. And that makes sense if you look at this. We're taking energy away from the car. That's negative work being done on the car. Moving on over here to the other side of the equal sign, we've got our final kinetic energy. Well, the final kinetic energy of the car is going to be one half times the car's mass, that's 1,000 kilograms, times the final velocity of the car. Now remember, we're trying to solve for the stopping distance of the car. That means the final velocity of the car is zero, which means the final kinetic energy is zero. Our final potential energy is going to be 1,000 times 9.8 times zero because the car still finishes on the ground. It hasn't moved up or down at all. So what we've done here is we've figured out all five variables or types of energies and works that exist within the work energy theorem. So let's use the work energy theorem to put all of these together. Just going through putting in each of these one at a time. We've got 1.25 times 10 to the six joules plus zero, our initial potential, minus 15,000 D. I say it's minus because we found the work by the brakes is negative. Now that's gonna equal our final kinetic and our final potential is zero plus zero. So we can clean this up a little bit, and we can show that the initial kinetic energy of the car has to equal, ultimately, the work done by the brakes in order to stop the car. So if we go through and we solve for the stopping distance, we'll find the total displacement is 83.3 meters. So what we've done here, rather than using Newton's second law and the kinematic equations, is we've gone through and we've solved for the stopping distance of the car using the work energy theorem and an understanding of force. There's one more thing I want to solve for in this problem, and that is how much the brakes are going to heat up. As the car slows down, the brakes are taking energy away from the car, and that energy has to go somewhere. Now it's the job of car brakes to turn kinetic energy, that is the energy associated with the motion of the car, into thermal energy or heat. So we have to know a few things about these brakes in order to solve this problem. So what I'll tell you is the brakes of the car have a total mass of 20 kilograms. And they're made of steel. And the reason that's important is because the specific heat of steel is 420 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So knowing the brakes are taking energy away from the car and having a few specs about the brakes here, we can actually go through and figure out just how much the brakes of the car are going to heat up as the car slows to a stop. So all that's happening here is the brakes are doing work. Now we know the work by the brakes. We can calculate that. We know the brakes, we're doing some work with a, a force of 15,000 Newtons over some displacement D, which we solved for, that was 83.3 meters. Really what we found is the brakes took away all of the kinetic energy of the car. So the work by the brakes was negative 1.25 times 10 to the sixth joules. Now that work by the brakes generated a whole bunch of heat. The kinetic energy was converted through work to thermal energy. So the change 
in thermal energy of the brakes was 1.25 times 10 to the sixth joules. And so what we're gonna do in this part of this problem is just pull in a little bit of information you learned in chemistry, and that is how to deal with heat and specific heat. And we'll tie it into physics. So you may remember the change in thermal energy is the mass times specific heat times change in temperature. And what we're trying to solve for is this value right here, the amount that brakes are going to heat up. This is what we're trying to solve for. So all we're gonna do is just plug in our values, our change in thermal energy. 1.25 times 10 to the sixth equals the total mass, that's 20 kilograms, times the specific heat, that's 420 joules per kilogram degree Celsius, times our change in temperature, or the change in temperature of the brakes. And if we solve for the change in temperature of the brakes, we find the brakes are gonna heat up by 149 degrees. That's a lot. And so you'll see, if you ever take a close look at the brakes of a car, they're actually made to dissipate heat or to shed heat. Because if the brakes heat up too much, uh, they can often fail. Or if you ever watch something like a race car at night, you can actually see those brakes glow. They'll get so hot, they start to glow. So, in this problem, we've managed to replace using Newton's second law in kinematics by using the work energy theorem. We've also tied in a little bit of chemistry and physical science by taking a look at specific heat in order to determine how much the brakes of the car are going to heat up. And so on that note, that's all for now.